Guns N' Roses is an American hard rock band from Los Angeles formed in 1985. The lineup, when first signed to Jeffen Records in 1986, consisted of vocalist Axel Rose, lead guitarist Slash, rhythm guitarist Izzy Stradlin, bassist Duff McKagan, and drummer Steven Adler. The current lineup consists of Rose, Slash, McKagan, keyboardists Dizzy Reed and Melissa Reese, guitarist Richard Fortas and drummer Frank Ferrer. The band has released six studio albums, accumulating sales of more than 100 million records worldwide, including shipments of 45 million in the United States, making them one of the world's best-selling bands of all time. Guns N' Roses' debut album, Appetite for Destruction, 1987, reached number one on the Billboard 200 a year after its release, on the strength of Sweet Child O' Mine, the band's only single to reach number one on the Billboard Hot 100. The album has sold approximately 30 million copies worldwide, including 18 million units in the United States, making it the best-selling debut album of all time in the U.S., as well as the 11th best-selling album in the United States. The success of the debut was followed by the eight-song album GNR Lies, 1988, which reached number two on the Billboard 200. The twin albums Use Your Illusion 1 and Use Your Illusion 2 1991, debuted at number two and number one on the Billboard 200 respectively and have sold a combined 35 million copies worldwide, including 14 million units in the United States. The cover album The Spaghetti Incident 1993, was the band's last studio album to feature Slash and McKagan. After more than a decade of work and several lineup changes, Guns N' Roses released the long-awaited album Chinese Democracy, 2008, which, at an estimated $14 million in production costs, is the most expensive rock album to ever be produced in music history. It debuted at number 3 on the Billboard 200 but undersold industry expectations, despite mostly positive critical reception. Classic era members Slash and McKagan both rejoined the band in 2016. Guns N' Roses has been credited with reviving the mainstream popularity of rock and roll, at a time when popular music was dominated by dance music and glam metal. Its late 1980s and early 1990s years have been described as the period in which the group brought forth a hedonistic rebelliousness reminiscent of the early Rolling Stones a reputation that had earned the group the nickname the most dangerous band in the world. The band's classic lineup, along with later members Reed and drummer Matt Sorum, was inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in 2012, in its first year of eligibility. History Formation, 1985-1986 In 1984, Hollywood Rose member Izzy Stradlin was living with L.A. Guns member Tracy I. Guns. When L.A. Guns needed a new vocalist, Stradlin suggested Hollywood Rose singer Axel Rose. Guns N' Roses was formed in March 1985 by Rose and rhythm guitarist Stradlin, along with lead guitarist Tracy I. Guns, bassist O.L.E. Bike, and drummer Rob Gardner of L.A. Guns. The band coined its name by combining the names of both previous groups. Rejected names for the band included Heads of Amazon and Aids. After a short time, during which the band reportedly played two or three shows, Bike was fired and replaced by Duff McKagan. Tracy I. Guns left the band after an argument with Rose leading to his replacement by Rose and Stradlin's one-time Hollywood Rose bandmate, Slash. Gardner quit soon after and was replaced by another former Hollywood Rose member, Stephen Adler. Slash had also previously played with McKagan and Adler in Road Crew. We had a singer, Mike Jagoz, that our manager didn't like, so we fired him. So then I asked Axel to join LA Guns and he was in the band for about six, seven months. The same manager ended up hating Axel and he wanted to fire him. We're all living together at this point and Axel and I sat down and went what are we going to do? So we both said fuck that, and came up with the name Guns N' Roses, which was going to be just a record label that we'd put singles out on. In June 1985, four days after the lineup was finalized, the band embarked on a short, disorganized tour of the West Coast, from Sacramento, California, to McKagan's hometown of Seattle, Washington. 
The so-called Hell Tour settled the band's first stable lineup, with McCagan later commenting, This trip had set a new benchmark for what we were capable of, what we could and would put ourselves through to achieve our goals as a band. Through the band's increasing presence on the Hollywood club scene playing famed bars such as the Troubadour and the Roxy Guns N' Roses drew the attention of major record labels. The group was signed by Jeffen Records in March 1986, receiving a $75,000 advance. In December of that year, the group released the four-song EP Live. Asterisk at Like a Suicide, designed to keep interest in the band alive while the group withdrew from the club scene to work in the studio. The EP contained covers of Rose Tattoo's Nice Boys and Aerosmith's Mama Kin, along with two original compositions, the punk-influenced Reckless Life and the classic rock-inspired Move to the City. Although billed as a live recording, the four songs were taken from the band's demo tapes and overdubbed with crowd noise. Live. Asterisk at Like a Suicide was released on the Jeffen subsidiary UZ Suicide, with production limited to 10,000 vinyl copies. Breakthrough in Mass Popularity, 1987-1989 Appetite for Destruction Guns N' Roses' debut album Appetite for Destruction was released July 21, 1987. The album underwent an artwork change after the original cover design by Robert Williams, which depicted a surrealist scene in which a dagger-toothed monster vengefully attacks a robot rapist was deemed too controversial. The band stated the original artwork was a symbolic social statement, with the robot representing the industrial system that's raping and polluting our environment. The revised cover was done by Andy Engel, based on a design by tattoo artist Bill White Jr., who had designed the artwork for a tattoo Rose had acquired the previous year. The artwork featured each of the five band members' skulls layered on a cross. In the U.S., Welcome to the Jungle was issued as the album's first single, with an accompanying music video. Initially, the album and single lingered for almost a year without performing well, but when Jeffen founder David Jeffen was asked to lend support to the band, he obliged, personally convincing MTV executives to play Welcome to the Jungle during the network's after-hours rotation. Even though the video was initially only played once at 4 a.m. on a Sunday, heavy metal and hard rock fans took notice and soon began requesting the video and song and Massey. The song, written in Seattle, was about Los Angeles. The music video took place in New York. According to Rose, the inspiration for the lyrics came from an encounter he and a friend had with a homeless man while they were coming out of a bus into New York. Trying to put a scare into the young runaways, the man yelled at them. You know where you are? You're in the jungle baby, you're gonna die. The song was featured in the 1988 Dirty Harry film The Dead Pool, starring Clint Eastwood, and members of the band had a cameo appearance in the film. Sweet Child O' Mine was the album's second U.S. single, a love song CO written by Rose as a poem for his then-girlfriend Erin Everly, daughter of Don Everly of the Everly Brothers. Due to the growing grassroots success of the band and the cross-gender appeal of the song, Sweet Child O' Mine and its accompanying music video received heavy airplay on both radio and MTV, becoming a huge hit during the summer of 1988 and reaching the top of the charts in the U.S. Later commented, I hated that song with a huge passion for the longest time, and it turned out to be our hugest hit, so it goes to show what I know. The song was released in Japan as part of the EP Live from the Jungle, which also featured a selection of live recordings from the band's June 1987 dates at London's The Marquee, the group's first shows outside the United States. The song is the highest charting Guns N' Roses song, and is the band's only song to reach number one on the Billboard Hot 100. After the success of Sweet Child O' Mine, Welcome to the Jungle was reissued as a single and reached number seven in the US. By the time Paradise City and its video reached the airwaves, Peaking at number 5 in the US, Appetite for Destruction had reached number 1 on the Billboard 200. To date, the album has sold in excess of 30 million copies worldwide, including 18 million units sold in the United States, making it the best-selling debut album of all time in the US, in addition to being the 11th best-selling album in the United States. Guns N' Roses toured extensively in support of their debut album, embarking on the 16-month-long Appetite for Destruction tour. 
In addition to headlining dates in Europe and the US, the band opened North American shows for The Cult, Motley Crue and Alice Cooper throughout the second half of 1987. During the 1987 tour, drummer Steven Adler broke his hand in a fight, and was replaced for eight shows by Cinderella drummer Fred Corey. Bassist Duff McKagan missed several shows in May 1988 to attend his wedding, Kid Haggis Chaos from The Cult filled in. Don Henley of the Eagles played drums for the band during the 1989 AMA show while Adler was in rehab. The band proceeded to tour the United States, Australia and Japan, while serving as opening acts on North America shows by Iron Maiden and Aerosmith. Tim Collins, Aerosmith's then manager, remarked, by the end of the tour, Guns N' Roses were huge. They basically just exploded. We were all pissed that Rolling Stone magazine showed up to do a story on Aerosmith, but Guns N' Roses ended up on the cover of the magazine. Suddenly, the opening act was bigger than we were. GNR lies. Izzy Stradlin was the band's rhythm guitarist from 1985 until 1991. Guns N' Roses' next album, GNR Lies, was released in November 1988. It included the four recordings from the band's 1986 EP Live. Asterisk at Like a Suicide, as well as four new acoustic tracks Patience, the only single released from GNR Lies, peaked at number four in the US, while the album itself reached number two on the Billboard 200. The album cover, a parody of tabloid newspapers, was modified after initial pressings to remove the headlines Wife Beating has been around for 10,000 years and ladies, welcome to the dark ages. The song One in a Million raised accusations of racism and homophobia. Rose denied that he was a racist and defended his use of a racial slur, claiming that it's a word to describe somebody that is basically a pain in your life, a problem. The word nigger doesn't necessarily mean black although he later conceded that he had used the word as an insult towards black people who had tried to rob him. In response to the allegations of homophobia, Rose stated that he considered himself pro-heterosexual and blamed this attitude on bad experiences with gay men. Guns N' Roses' late 1980s shows were often eventful for more than just the band's performance. During a November 1987 show in Atlanta, Rose assaulted a security guard and was held backstage by police while his bandmates continued playing with a roadie singing. Riots nearly broke out during two August 1988 shows in New York State. At England's Monsters of Rock Festival, held that same month, two fans were crushed to death during the groups set by the slam dancing crowd. During the first of four October 1989 dates opening for the Rolling Stones at the LA Coliseum, Rose announced that the shows would be the group's last if certain members of the band did not stop dancing with Mr. Brownstone, a reference to the band's song of the same name about heroin. Events such as these helped earn Guns N' Roses the moniker the most dangerous band in the world. International Success and Band Turmoil, 1990-1993 Use Your Illusion 1 and 2 In 1990, Guns N' Roses returned to the studio to begin recording the band's most ambitious undertaking yet. Drummer Steven Adler was briefly fired from the band over his drug use, but he was reinstated after signing a contract in which he vowed to stop taking drugs. During the recording session of Civil War, Adler was unable to perform well due to his struggles with cocaine and heroin addiction, and his difficulties in the studio caused the band to do nearly 30 takes. Adler claimed at the time he was sick from taking opiate blockers to try to kick his addictions. Adler was fired on July 11, 1990 as a result, and later filed a lawsuit against the band. Adler recalled the reason for the lawsuit and recapped his firing in a 2005 interview. Doug Goldstein called me into the office about two weeks later. He wanted me to sign some contracts. I was told that every time I did heroin, the band would fine me $2,000. There was a whole stack of papers, with colored paper clips everywhere for my signatures. What these contracts actually said was that the band were paying me $2,000 to leave. They were taking my royalties, all my writing credits. They didn't like me anymore and just wanted me gone. That's why I filed the lawsuit, to get all those things back. Martin Chambers, Pretenders, and Adam Maples, 
sea hags, were considered for the vacant drum position. The position was filled by drummer Matt Sorum, who had played briefly with the cult. Slash credited Sorum with preventing the band from breaking up at the time. In response to an interviewer's suggestion that replacing Adler with Sorum had turned Guns N' Roses from a rock and roll band into a heavy metal one, Stradlin responded, Yeah, a big musical difference. The first time I realized what Steve did for the band was when he broke his hand in Michigan. Tried to punch through a wall and busted his hand. So we had Fred Corey come in from Cinderella for the Houston show. Fred played technically good and steady, but the songs sounded just awful. They were written with Steve playing the drums and his sense of swing was the push and pull that give the songs their feel. When that was gone, it was just, unbelievable, weird. Nothing worked. A few months prior, keyboardist Dizzy Reed became the sixth member of the group when he joined as a full-time member. Reed was previously bandmates with Matt Sorum and Johnny Crash. The band fired its manager, Alan Niven, replacing him with Doug Goldstein in May 1991. According to a 1991 cover story by Rolling Stone magazine, Rose forced the dismissal of Niven, against the wishes of some of his bandmates, by refusing to complete the albums until he was replaced. With enough music for two albums, the band released Use Your Illusion 1 and Use Your Illusion 2 on September 17, 1991. The tactic paid off when the albums debuted at number 2 and number 1 respectively in the Billboard charts, setting a record as the band became the only group to achieve this feat until hip-hop artist Nelly accomplished the same in 2004. The album sold 770,000 units, Use Your Illusion 2 and 685,000 units, Use Your Illusion 1 in first week sales. Both albums spent 108 weeks on the chart. The two albums have sold a combined 35 million copies worldwide, as well as 14 million sold in the United States. Guns N' Roses accompanied the Use Your Illusion albums with many videos, including Don't Cry, November Rain and Estranged, some of the most expensive music videos ever made. The hit ballad November Rain, number 3 US, became the most requested video on MTV eventually winning the 1992 MTV Video Music Award for Best Cinematography. It is also the longest song in U.S. chart history to reach the top 10, clocking in at 8.57. During the awards show, the band performed the song with Elton John accompanying on piano. Both prior to and after the release of the albums, Guns N' Roses embarked on the 28-month-long Use Your Illusion tour. It became famous for both its financial success and the many controversial incidents that occurred at the shows. The tour had 92 dates in 27 countries, with over 7 million people attending concerts. It is considered the longest tour in rock history. Use Your Illusion Tour The Use Your Illusion World Tour program included a guitar solo from Slash based on the Godfather theme, a piano driven cover of It's All Right by Black Sabbath and an extended jam on the classic rock-inspired move to the city, where the group showcased the ensemble of musicians assembled for the tour. Many of the successful performances during the tour were overshadowed in the press by riots, late starts, and outspoken rants by Rose. While the band's previous drug and alcohol issues were seemingly under control, Rose was often agitated by lax security, sound problems, and unwanted filming or recording of the performances. He also used the time between songs to fire off political statements or retorts against music critics or celebrity rivals. On July 2, 1991, at the Riverport Amphitheater in Maryland Heights, Missouri, just outside St. Louis, during a performance of Rocket Queen, Rose discovered that a fan was filming the show with a camera. After asking the venue's security to take away the camera, Rose decided to take it himself jumping into the audience and tackling the fan. He had a heated confrontation with the fan before physically assaulting him. After being pulled out of the audience by members of the crew, Rose said, Well, thanks to the lame-ass security, I'm going home, threw his microphone to the ground and stormed off the stage. The angry crowd rioted, injuring dozens. Footage was captured by Robert John, who was documenting the entire tour. Rose was wanted by the police for inciting the riot, 
but police were unable to arrest him until almost a year later, as the band went overseas to continue the tour. Charges were filed against Rose, but a judge ruled that he did not directly incite the riot. In his defense, Rose stated that the Guns N' Roses security team had made four separate requests to the venue's security staff to remove the camera, all of which were ignored, and that other members of the band had reported being hit by bottles launched from the audience while the security staff was refusing to enforce a drinking limit. As a result, Use Your Illusions liner notes featured a hidden message amidst the Thank You section, Fuck You, St. Louis. Rhythm guitarist Izzy Stradlin abruptly quit the band on November 7, 1991, after a repeat of the St. Louis incident nearly unfolded during a concert in Germany. Stradlin cited a combination of Rose's personal behavior, his mismanagement of the band, and difficulties being around Slash, Sorum, and McCagan, due to his newfound sobriety and their continuing alcohol and substance addictions. Stradlin later commented, Once I quit drugs, I couldn't help looking around and asking myself, is this all there is? I was just tired of it, I needed to get out. Slash commented on finding a replacement, saying, When Izzy left, we realized that we either had to find a new guitarist in three weeks or cancel a bunch of gigs. I had a piece of paper with about 30-odd candidates listed. Duff was looking around and Axel had his ideas, but nobody seemed right. For a while it looked like Dave Navarro from Jane's Addiction was going to join, but he couldn't get it together, so that never happened. Stradlin was eventually replaced by Los Angeles-based guitarist Gilby Clark, whom Slash credited for saving the band. During many shows throughout the tour, Rose introduced Clark to the audience, and Slash and Clark would then play Wild Horses, a Rolling Stones cover. In late 1991, the band added a touring ensemble, which included a horns section and several background vocalists. In 1992, Clark broke his arm in a motorcycle accident during the tour, and was replaced for several weeks by Stradlin. In 1992, the band appeared at the Freddie Mercury tribute concert, performing a three-song set. Because of the controversial song One in a Million, activist group ACT UP demanded that the band be dropped from the bill, and urged other artists to shun the group and the crowd to boo it. Members of Queen dismissed the activists, with lead guitarist Brian May stating people seem so blind. Don't they realize that the mere fact that Guns N' Roses are here is the biggest statement that you could get? Slash later performed Tie Your Mother Down with the remaining members of Queen and Def Leppard vocalist Joe Elliott, while Rose performed We Will Rock You and sang a duet with Elton John on Bohemian Rhapsody. Their personal set included Paradise City and Knockin' on Heaven's Door. When the band returned to the U.S. for the second leg of the Use Your Illusion tour, Brian May opened the shows with the Brian May Band. Rose had originally wanted the grunge band, and Jeff and label mates, Nirvana to open the band's Use Your Illusion tour, but lead singer Kurt Cobain refused. Later in the year, Guns N' Roses went on the Guns N' Roses Metallica Stadium tour, with American heavy metal band Metallica, being supported by Faith No More, Motorhead, and Body Count. During a show in August 1992 at Montreal's Olympic Stadium, Metallica's lead singer James Hetfield suffered second-degree burns to his hands and face after malfunctions with a pyrotechnics blast. Metallica was forced to cancel the second hour of the show, but promised to return to the city for another performance. After a long delay, during which the audience became increasingly restless, Guns N' Roses took the stage. However, the shortened time between sets did not allow for adequate tuning of stage monitors, resulting in members of GNR not being able to hear themselves. In addition, Rose claimed that his throat hurt, causing the band to leave the stage early. The cancellation led to another audience riot, with three police officers and ten rioters injured. Police made at least a dozen arrests related to the incident. The pyro incident and riot can be seen on video in a year and a half in the life of Metallica. In a segment on the video, Hetfield mocked Rose and read his personal tour writer, making fun of various items on the list. Rose responded by addressing the crowd during a later concert, labeling Hetfield a racist for his decision to pull body count from the tour, and called him a stupid little cocksucker while bashing the rest of the band. 
On VH1's Behind the Music documentary about Metallica, Hetfield stated that we couldn't relate to Axel and his attitude. Other members of Metallica and Rose himself both stated that the two groups never really gelled. In mid-1993, former drummer Steven Adler's lawsuit against the band was settled out of court, Adler received a back payment check of $2,250,000 and 15% royalties for songs he recorded. The Use Your Illusion tour ended in Buenos Aires, Argentina, on July 17, 1993. The tour set attendance records and lasted for 28 months, in which 194 shows were played. The show in Buenos Aires marked the last time that Sorum and Clark would play a live show with Rose. It was also the last time Slash performed with Rose until rejoining the band in 2016. The Spaghetti Incident Gilby Clark replaced Izzy Stradlin as rhythm guitarist, playing from 1991 to 1994. On November 23, 1993, Guns N' Roses released a collection of punk and glam rock covers entitled The Spaghetti Incident. Izzy Stradlin's recorded guitar parts were replaced by Gilby Clark. Many of the tracks were recorded during the same sessions as the Illusions albums, which were originally intended to produce three or four albums. Initially, the band was going to release a covers EP in 1992 or 1993, but decided on making a full album and recorded more songs. Bassist Duff McKagan sings on many of the album's tracks and Hanoi Rock's frontman Michael Monroe appears on Ain't It Fun as a guest vocalist. Slash described the recording of the album as spontaneous and unpainted. The title of the album is an inside joke referring to a food fight that occurred between Axel Rose and Steven Adler. During his lawsuit against the band, Adler's attorney described the food fight as the spaghetti incident. The meaning was explained by drummer Matt Sorum in a 1994 interview with Much Music and confirmed by Slash in his autobiography, Slash. An unadvertised cover of the Charles Manson song Look At Your Game, Girl was included on the album. The track was kept secret and was not included on advance tapes sent out to reviewers. Band manager Doug Goldstein stated there is a bonus track on the album, but Axel wants it to speak for itself, and that it wasn't done for the critics or anybody else. It was a bonus for the fans. The inclusion of the song caused controversy, with law enforcement and victims' rights groups expressing outrage. Rose claimed the reason we didn't list that song on our album is we wanted to downplay it. We don't give any credit to Charles Manson on the album, it's like a hidden bonus truck sick dot. The band considered removing the song from new pressings of the album, and David Jeffen stated in a phone interview, I would hope that if Axel Rose had realized how offensive people would find this, he would not have ever recorded this song in the first place. The fact that Charles Manson would be earning money based on the fame he derived committing one of the most horrific crimes of the 20th century is unthinkable to me. Slash mentioned that the song was done with naive and innocent black humor on our part. Rose stated he would donate all performance royalties from the song to a non-profit environmental organization. Slash stated that the group intended to remove the song before the band decided to keep it after learning that royalties from the song would be donated to the Bartek Frykowski the son of Wojciech Frykowski, a victim of Manson during the Tate murders. Jeffen Records released a statement mentioning that the label's share of royalties would be donated to the Doris Tate crime victims. Bureau. Years later, Rose said the song would be removed from new pressings of the album, claiming that critics and the media had misinterpreted his interest in Manson. Rose can be seen wearing a Manson shirt in the video for Estranged and during a concert in Milton Keynes, England, in 1993. Rose explained wearing the shirt as trying to make a statement because a lot of people enjoy playing me as the bad guy and the crazy. Sorry, I'm not that guy. I'm nothing like him. Despite the statement that the track would be removed, Look At Your Game, Girl is still featured on pressings of the album. The album debuted at number 4 on the Billboard charts, and sold 190,000 copies its first week. Despite initial success, The Spaghetti Incident, did not match the sales of the Illusion albums and its release consequently led to increased tension within the band. Member Departures and Sporadic Activity, 1994-1999 
Interviews with Guns N' Roses band members suggest that between 1994 and 1996, the band sporadically began to write and record new material, most of which, according to Slash, had been written by Rose. Rose has stated the exact opposite in the open letter on the official Guns N' Roses website in 2008, saying that the album was mostly a Slash album and Rose was allowed very little input into the album. According to Matt Sorum, in 1996, the band had recorded seven songs, with seven more in the writing stages, and intended to release a single album with ten or twelve songs, with a release date of spring 1997. Sorum also mentioned that Slash's Snake Pit's debut album, It's Five O'Clock Somewhere, could have been a Guns N' Roses album, but Axel didn't think it was good enough. In May 1994, Gilby Clark mentioned in an interview that there was no next Guns N' Roses album adding, we started working on one, and it got canned. Sorum described the would-be album as not as sophisticated as Illusion, but not as wild as Appetite. The album was also described as consisting of up-tempo rock songs with no ballads, according to Duff McKagan. In a 2002 interview, Rose complimented the guitar work Slash had laid down, saying it was the best playing he's done at least since Illusions. Rose mentioned the material was scrapped due to the lack of collaboration between band members. He later told USA Today in a 2012 interview that he didn't write any music for years in the mid-1990s because of criticism from bandmates Slash and Duff McKagan, as well as ex-fiancé Stephanie Seymour. In January 1994, Rose inducted Elton John into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, and later that night performed a duet with Bruce Springsteen on a cover of the Beatles' song Come Together. It was Rose's final public performance for six years. Also in 1994, all of the members of the band at the time contributed to Gilby Clark's debut album, Pawn Shop Guitars. In December 1994, Guns N' Roses released a cover recording of the Rolling Stones' Sympathy for the Devil. The song appeared in the film's interview with the vampire and Fallen. The song was also released separately as a single. Entertainment Weekly stated that the note-for-note -note remake works up a decent lather but seems utterly bankrupt. It is the final Guns N' Roses track to feature Slash on lead guitar, Duff McKagan on bass, and Matt Sorum on drums. The song also featured Rose's childhood friend and Hollywood Rose collaborator Paul Huge Tobias on rhythm guitar. Tobias's presence on the track and in the band created tension, reportedly Slash had, both, creative and personal differences with Tobias. A 2001 interview revealed Slash told his bandmates in September 1996, I'm going to confront it. Either Paul goes, or I go. Dot. Guitarist Zach Wilde played with the band for several weeks and was considered as a potential second guitarist in 1995. Gilby Clark's contract was not renewed and he was gone from the band by 1995. Slash stated in his book that Rose fired Clark without consulting anyone, claiming he was only a hired hand. Clark was not involved in the recording of Sympathy for the Devil, stating I knew that that was the ending of Clark's involvement in Guns N' Roses because nobody told me about it. Officially I was in the band at that time and they did that song without me. Clark also mentioned that before the final show of the Use Your Illusion tour, Rose came up to him and told him, Hey, enjoy your last show. Clark later sued the band over the use of his likeness in Guns N' Roses' Pinball. In 1996, Rose, Slash, McKagan, and former member Izzy Stradlin all appeared as guests on the Outpatient's debut album Anxious Disease a band featuring Guns N' Roses collaborator West Arkeen. The recording of Sympathy for the Devil, as well as tension between him and Rose, led Slash to quit the band officially in October 1996. Rose sent a fax notifying MTV of Slash's departure, with Slash responding Axel and I have not been capable of seeing eye to eye on Guns N' Roses for some time. We tried to collaborate, but at this point, I'm no longer in the band. Slash also stated, Axel's whole visionary style, as far as his input in Guns N' Roses, is completely different from mine. I just like to play guitar, write a good riff, go out there and play, as opposed to presenting an image. 
Slash was replaced by Nine Inch Nails touring guitarist Robin Fink in January 1997, who signed a two-year contract with the band in August 1997, making him an official member. Fink was originally recommended by Matt Sorum to Rose a year earlier as a possible second guitarist to complement Slash. Slash's departure was followed shortly thereafter by Matt Sorum in April 1997, who was fired by Rose after getting in an argument about Tobias's inclusion in the band. Sorum later stated Tobias was the Yoko Ono of Guns N' Roses. McCagan was the last of the Appetite lineup to leave, resigning as bassist in August 1997. McCagan had recently become a father and wrote about his decision to leave in his autobiography, stating Guns had been paying rent on studios for three years now from 1994 to 1997 and still did not have a single song. The whole operation was so erratic that it didn't seem to fit with my hopes for parenthood, for stability. McCagan was replaced later that year by former replacements bassist Tommy Stinson. An actual breakup of Guns N' Roses never occurred as new players were brought in as the old ones left. Rose reportedly purchased the full rights to the Guns N' Roses name in 1997. Slash claimed he and bandmates signed over the name Enduris, stating Axel refused to go on stage one night during the Use Your Illusion tour in 1992 unless the band signed away the name rights to the band. Unfortunately, we signed it. I didn't think he'd on stage otherwise. Rose denied the claim saying, it, never happened, all made up, fallacy and fantasy. Not one single solitary thread of truth to it. Had that been the case I would have have been cremated years ago legally, could have cleaned me out for the name and damages. It's called under duress with extenuating circumstances. Rose auditioned multiple potential band members, including Chris Vrenna, Zach Wilde, Dave Abruzzese, and Michael Bland. Rolling Stone reported in April 1997 that the lineup of Guns N' Roses was Rose, McCagan, Tobias, Fink, and Vrenna. Josh Fries was ultimately hired to replace Sorum on drums, joining in the summer of 1997. By the end of 1998, a new version of Guns N' Roses had emerged, vocalist Axel Rose, bassist Tommy Stinson, drummer Josh Fries, lead guitarist Robin Fink, rhythm guitarist Paul Tobias keyboardist Dizzy Reed, and multi-instrumentalist Chris Pittman. Jeffen released an edited single-disc version of the Illusion albums in 1998, entitled Use Your Illusion. In November 1999, the label released Live Era 8793 a collection of live performances from various concerts during the Appetite for Destruction and Use Your Illusion tours. Former guitarist Slash described the selection of songs of the album as a very mutual effort, further adding the live album was one of the easiest projects we all worked on. I didn't actually see Axel, but we communicated via the powers that be. The New Guns N' Roses and Chinese Democracy, 1999-2008 A New Guns N' Roses album had reportedly been in the works since 1994, with Rose the only original member still in the band. Moby was reported to be producing with Guns N' Roses in 1997, with work that sources described as sounding different from the sound you know, definitely electronic influenced. Mike Klink, who had previously produced every Guns N' Roses album, was also attached to produce in May 1997. In April 1998, Moby was replaced by Youth, and the album was still in the writing stages. In July 1998, Journalist Neil Strauss indicated that an electronica-influenced album by a new Guns N' Roses lineup was due in 1999. Rolling Stone stated that the label planned for the album to be released in late 1999. By August 1999, the band had recorded over 30 songs for the album, tentatively titled 2000 Intentions. September 1999 saw Youth being replaced by producer Sean Bevan. In November 1999, during an interview with Kurt Loder for MTV, Rose said that he had re-recorded Appetite for Destruction with the then new band, apart from two songs which he had replaced with Patience and You Could Be Mine. During the interview, Rose announced the title of the upcoming album Chinese Democracy, stating, There's a lot of Chinese democracy movements, and it's something that there's a lot of talk about, 
and it's something that will be nice to see. It could also just be like an ironic statement. I don't know, I just like the sound of it. The album has, a lot of different sounds. There's some heavy songs, there's a lot of aggressive songs, but they're all in different styles and different sounds. It is truly a melting pot. Band manager Doug Goldstein stated in November 1999 that the band had almost finished recording the music, and the album was due out sometime in 2000. Later that month, the band released a new song, the industrial-styled Oh My God, which was included on the soundtrack of the film End of Days. The track featured additional guitar work by Dave Navarro and Gary Sunshine, Rose's personal guitar teacher. Rose claimed that former members Duff McKagan and Matt Sorum had failed to see the potential of the song and had no interest in recording or playing the piece. In August 1999, guitarist Robin Fink departed to rejoin his former band, Nine Inch Nails, on tour. In March 2000, avant-garde guitarist Brian Carroll, more commonly referred to as Buck Theod, joined Guns N' Roses as a replacement for Fink. Also in March 2000, drummer Josh Fries left the band, being replaced with Brian Brain Mantia, formerly of Primus. Mantia, a childhood friend of Carol's, had previously worked with Buck Theod in several bands, including Praxis. Robin Fink returned to the band in late 2000, to complement Buck Theod on lead guitar. Queen guitarist Brian May and former Queen producer Roy Thomas Baker worked with the band in 2000. With the album nearing completion in mid-2000, Baker convinced Rose to re-record the entire album, causing further delays. In an interview with Rolling Stone in February 2000, Rose played several songs of the upcoming album to reporters, including Chinese Democracy, Catcher in the Rye, I.R.S., The Blues, there was a time and Oklahoma. Rose mentioned that part of the delay of the new album was him educating himself about the technology that's come to define rock, stating that it's like from scratch, learning how to work with something, and not wanting it just to be something you did on a computer. Rolling Stone described the album as Led Zeppelin's physical graffiti remixed by Beck and Trent Reznor. Rose mentioned that the expense of the record would be negated by the recording sessions yielding multiple albums including a record that is more industrial and electronica influenced than Chinese democracy. At that point, the album had gone through multiple producers, including Youth, Moby, Mike Klink, Roy Thomas Baker, Eric Cotius. At the time, Sean Bavan was producing, but Karim Costanzo and Axel Rose became the final credited producers on the album. He album had been completely re recorded several times with varying musicians and producers. In a 2001 interview, Rose described the album as having all kinds of styles, many influences as blues, mixed in the songs, and said that it was not industrial. Describing why he continued using the Guns N' Roses name, instead of labeling the upcoming album an Axel Rose solo album, Rose stated it is something I lived by before these guys were in it. And there were other people in Guns N' Roses before them, you know. I contemplated letting go of that, but it doesn't feel right in any way. I am not the person who chose to try to kill it and walked away. It's not an Axel Rose album, even if it's what I wanted it to be. Everybody is putting everything they've got into singing and building. Maybe I'm helping steer it to what it should be built like. Also in the interview, Rose attributed the breakup of the old lineup to drug addictions and an effort from inside the band to destroy him, stating there was an effort to bring me down. It was a king of the mountain thing, and that he needed to take control to survive. Rose also described the dissolution as a divorce. Jim Barber, a former Ondar executive with Jeffen, stated that the new album reminded me of the best moments of 70s Pink Floyd or later Led Zeppelin. There's nothing out there right now that has that kind of scope. Axel hasn't spent the last several years struggling to write Use Your Illusion over again. Eight years after the previous Guns N' Roses concert, the band made a public appearance in January 2001 with two well-received concerts, one in Las Vegas and one at the Rock in Rio Festival in Rio de Janeiro. The band played both songs from previous albums and songs from then-unreleased Chinese Democracy. During the band's Rock in Rio set, Rose made the following comment regarding former members of the band. 
the group played a further two shows in Las Vegas at the end of 2001. Former guitarist Slash claimed that he tried to attend a show and was turned away at the door by security. Due to his frustrations with touring, rhythm guitarist Paul Tobias left the band in 2002 and was replaced by Richard Fortas, formerly of the psychedelic Furs and Love Spit Love. Fortas is good friends with and had previously collaborated with bassist Tommy Stinson, who recommended him for the position. Producer Roy Thomas Baker was fired in February 2002. Drudge Report reported in June 2002 that Chinese Democracy was scheduled for a September 2, 2002 release. The band then played several shows in August 2002, headlining festivals and concerts throughout Asia and Europe, including Puck El Pop, Summer Sonic Festival, and the Carling Weekend. At the 2002 MTV Video Music Awards on August 29, 2002, Guns N' Roses closed the show in a previously unannounced performance, playing Welcome to the Jungle, Madagascar, and Paradise City. In November 2002, the band's first North American tour since 1993 was organized to support Chinese democracy, with CKY and Mix Master Mike joining. However, the opening show in Vancouver was cancelled by the venue when Rose failed to turn up. According to Guns Management, Axel's flight from LA had been delayed by mechanical troubles. A riot ensued. This tour was met with mixed results. Some concerts did not sell well, while shows in larger markets such as New York City sold out in minutes. Due to a second riot by fans in Philadelphia when the band failed to show up again, tour promoter Clear Channel cancelled the remainder of the tour. Rose later mentioned in 2006. There are reasons that I have not spoken more about cancelled shows in Vancouver and Philadelphia that have been extremely complicated and are not legally resolved behind the scenes to this day and could have possibly jeopardized the future of Guns N' Roses. Rose then apologized to the city of Philadelphia when playing there in 2012, adding I'm not saying I'm innocent. The band went on hiatus until it was scheduled to play at Rock in Rio Lisboa in May 2004. However, Buckthead left the band in March of that year, causing the band to cancel. Buckthead reportedly left the band because of the inability to complete an album or tour, according to his manager. Rose claimed the band has been put in an untenable position by guitarist Buckthead and his untimely departure. During his tenure with the band, Buckthead has been inconsistent and erratic in both his behavior and commitment despite being under contract, creating uncertainty and confusion and making it virtually impossible to move forward with recording, rehearsals and live plans with confidence. His transient lifestyle has made it impossible for even his closest friends to have nearly any form of communication with him whatsoever. That same month, Jeffen released Guns N' Roses' greatest hits, since Rose had failed to deliver a new studio album in more than 10 years. Lash and McCagan joined Rose in suing Jeffen to stop the release of the album, which was compiled without authorization from any current or former band members. The lawsuit was thrown out and the album went triple platinum in the US, eventually going on to be the third longest charting album in the Nielsen Soundscan era. McCagan and Slash also joined Rose in an unsuccessful effort to prevent the release of the roots of Guns N' Roses. By 2005, Jeffen had taken Chinese democracy off of its release schedule and pulled funding, stating having exceeded all budgeted and approved recording costs by millions of dollars, it is Mr. Rose's obligation to fund and complete the album, not Jeffen's. Around then, manager Merck Mercuriatus stated that the Chinese democracy album is very close to being completed. According to a 2005 report by The New York Times, Rose had allegedly spent $13 million in the studio by that point. Mercuriatus rejected the budget claims made by the New York Times article and claimed that the newspaper's sources had not been involved with the project for six to nine years. The $13 million makes the album the most expensive rock album ever produced. In February 2006, demos of the songs Better, Catcher in the Rye, I.R.S., and there was a time were leaked onto the internet through a Guns N' Roses fan site. The band's management requested that all links to the MP3 files and all lyrics to the songs be removed from forums and websites. Despite this, radio stations began adding IRS to playlists, 
and the song reached number 49 on the Radio and Records Active Rock National Airplay chart in the final week of February. In August 2006, Slash and McCagan sued Rose over Guns N' Roses publishing and songwriter credits, which Rose's lawyer claimed were due to a clerical error while changing publishers. After a recommendation by guitar virtuoso Joe Satriani, guitarist Ron Bumblefoot Thal was contacted by keyboardist Chris Pittman in 2004. After sending demos and jamming with the band, Thal officially joined Guns N' Roses in 2006, replacing Buck Theod. Thal made his live debut with the band at the Hammerstein Ballroom in New York City on May 12, 2006, the band's first live show in over three years. Five warm-up shows before a North American tour were held in September 2006. The tour officially commenced on October 24 in Miami. Drummer Frank Ferrer replaced Brian Mantia, who took a leave of absence to be with his wife and newborn child. Ferrer had previously worked with Richard Fortas in the psychedelic Furs and Love Spit Love, and had been a member of several other bands, including The Beautiful. Coinciding with the tour, the song Better was featured in an internet advertisement for Harley Davidson in October 2006. Keyboardist Dizzy Reed stated that the release was an accident, with two versions being made, one experimental edit featuring a demo of Better and one with Paradise City. The ad with Better was mislabeled and inadvertently uploaded online for a day before being replaced by the intended ad with Paradise City. That same month, Rolling Stone published an article revealing that Andy Wallace would be mixing the final album. In November 2006 shows in Portland, Maine, were cancelled, with the band claiming it was due to limitations imposed by local fire marshals. Rose later apologized in a statement, stating we have chosen to take the public heat for these events in order to have another shot at the future today with a new album. In December 2006, Rose released an open letter to fans announcing that Merc Mercuriatus had been fired as the band's manager. He revealed that the last four dates of the North American tour would be cut so the band could work on post production for Chinese Democracy. He also set a tentative release date for the album for the first time since the album's announcement, March 6, 2007. On February 23, 2007, Del James announced that the recording stage of Chinese Democracy was finished and the band had now moved on to mixing the album, mentioning after some delays and scheduling difficulties, things appear to be moving along. However, this proved that the March 6 release date would be impossible to achieve, and the album once again had no scheduled release date. In a December 2007 interview, Sebastian Bach claimed Rose had planned to have the album released by Christmas 2007, I know Axel was very serious about putting something out before Christmas. He was talking to me about it. He was talking about finishing liner notes. Bach also said that Chinese democracy's delay might be because of business problems, I think there's a lot of business shit that goes on with him. It's just not as easy. It's a little more complicated than people think. Also in February 2007, the final version of Better leaked online to positive reviews. On May 4, 2007, three more tracks leaked from Chinese Democracy, an updated version of I.R.S., the blues and the title track. All three tracks had previously been played live. Guns N' Roses embarked on the 2007 leg of the Chinese Democracy World Tour in Mexico in June, followed by dates in Australia and Japan. The songs Nice Boys and Don't Cry, appearing as an instrumental Bumblefoot solo, were played for the first time since the Use Your Illusion tour. The tour ended on the 20th anniversary of Appetite for Destruction's release date, in Osaka. During this tour, the band featured vocalist Axel Rose, Robin Fink, Ron Thal, and Richard Fortas on guitars, Tommy Stinson on bass, Dizzy Reed, and Chris Pittman on keyboards and Frank Ferrer on drums. Rumors arose that Chinese democracy had been handed over to Jeffen Records, but had been delayed because the label and Rose could not agree on the marketing of the album in early 2008. Eddie Trunk also claimed Jeffen might have the album, I hear the new GNR CD is actually done, but the delay in release is not the band's issues but the label. There is so much money tied up in this record that in today's business it will be virtually impossible to be profitable, 
meaning the label might want to sell it off but can not find a buyer since nobody buys CDs anymore. Problem might not be Axel this time around and might keep this CD in limbo for more years to come. Hopefully it gets resolved. However, in a February 2008 interview with Classic Rock magazine, Rose's manager, Beta Liebes, debunked Trunk's suggestion and stated the band is in negotiations with the record label, and the album had been finished since Christmas 2007. On March 26, 2008, Dr. Pepper announced a plan to give everyone in America except the band's former guitarist Slash and Buck Theat a free can of Dr. Pepper if the band released Chinese Democracy before the end of 2008. Rose stated he was surprised and very happy about the announcement, adding, as some of Buckath's performances are on our album, I'll share my Dr. Pepper with him. With the announcement from Guns N' Roses regarding a release date in November, Tony Jacobs, Dr. Pepper's Vice President of Marketing for Dr. Pepper, announced a free soda coupon campaign for 24 hours on Sunday, November 23, 2008. However, due to heavy volume on the server throughout the entire day, it was impossible to submit for a free coupon. On March 27, 2008, the day after Dr. Pepper's announcement, the band members announced that they had hired a new management team, headed by Irving Ozoff and Andy Gould. The band later condemned Dr. Pepper for the failed promotion. In a letter to Dr. Pepper, Rose's lawyer Alan Gutman said the redemption scheme your company clumsily implemented for this offer was an unmitigated disaster which defrauded consumers and, in the eyes of vocal fans, ruined Chinese democracy's release. Rose's lawyer also demanded that the company make a full-page apology that would appear in The Wall Street Journal, USA Today the New York Times and the Los Angeles Times. In a 2009 interview, Rose stated he specifically told his lawyers it was a non-issue and was taken off guard by their actions, believing they should be focused on the record release. Amidst industry rumors in April 2008 that a release was coming soon, nine tracks purported to be from Chinese democracy were leaked to a website on June 19, 2008 but were quickly removed due to a cease and desist letter from the band's label. Point six of the leaked tracks had surfaced previously in some form, while three were new. The leaked songs were more fleshed out than previously heard tracks. On July 14, 2008, Harmonix, in conjunction with MTV Games, officially announced the release of a new song from the upcoming Chinese Democracy album, called Shackler's Revenge, through the new game Rock Band 2. The entire album was eventually added to the game as DLC in April 2009. The song If the World debuted October 10, 2008, playing in the end credits of the Ridley Scott film Body of Lies. In late August, speculation about the impending release of the album resurfaced, further fueled by separate reports from both Rolling Stone and Billboard about a November 25th release date as a Best Buy exclusive. This was finally confirmed October 22 when band management, Best Buy, and Interscope Jeff and Ondem Records officially issued a joint press release confirming the much-anticipated release of the album in the U.S. on November 23 as a Best Buy exclusive. Several days before its official release, the band streamed the entire Chinese Democracy album on the group's MySpace page. The album was streamed over 3 million times, breaking the MySpace record for most streamed album ever. Chinese Democracy, the band's sixth studio album and its first since 1993's The Spaghetti Incident, was released on November 22, 2008, in Europe and Australia, in North America on November 23, 2008, and in the United Kingdom on November 24, 2008. The album had an estimated $14 million in production costs, making it the most expensive rock album to ever be produced in music history. Debuted at number 3 on the Billboard 200 but undersold industry expectations, despite generally positive critical reception. Rock and Roll Hall of Fame Induction, Touring and Appetite for Democracy, 2009-2014 In an MTV phone interview with Kurt Loder in 1999, Rose said he and the then new band had recorded enough material for a double album. In an informal chat with Rolling Stone magazine in February 2006, Rose stated the band had 32 songs in the works. 
While appearing on various fan message boards in December 2008, Rose stated several working titles of songs for a possible future album. Among the working titles were, Elvis Presley and the Monster of Soul, Soul Monster, formerly known as Leave Me Alone, Atlas Shrugged, 7, The General, Time, Ides of March, Berlin, formerly Oklahoma, Zodiac, Quick Song, and Down by the Ocean, CO written by original member Izzy Stradlin. During the chat, he mentioned the Bridge of Soul Monster as the band's most Black Sabbath moment, and referred to it as the meanest section of anything I've sung to date. In a 2007 interview, Rose's close friend Sebastian Bach stated the general had a heavy sound with screaming vocals and also said it was the sequel to the 1991 classic ballad Estranged from the album Use Your Illusion 2. Bach also remarked that Chinese Democracy would be the first installment in a trilogy of new albums, and that Rose had told him the third, as yet untitled, album had been slated for 2012, although the year ended without seeing a release past Chinese Democracy. The initial plan for Chinese Democracy in 2001 was to record two albums, release Chinese Democracy, tour for a year or two, then release the second album without having to return to the studio. Former drummer Brian Mantia mentioned working on a club remix of Shackler's Revenge, stating that Rose planned to put out a remix album of songs from Chinese Democracy. Guitarist DJ Ashba has said that the next album is being discussed stating that the band has been throwing around a bunch of ideas and joked that the next album won't take as long to release. On April 20, 2011, Ashba said in an interview at the Revolver Golden Gods Awards that Guns N' Roses have been working on new songs every day. In an interview with reporter Nui Te Koha on Triple M Melbourne's The Hot Breakfast, Ashba talked about songs Rose has written, stating, Axel has a lot of great songs up his sleeve. He probably has three albums worth of stuff recorded. The stuff I've heard. I've been up in his hotel room many nights and he just sits down at the piano and plays. I'm like this is amazing, people have to hear this song and he's like ah, this is something I'm tinkering on. On February 6, 2009, Rose gave his first interview in nine years when he sat down with Billboard's Jonathan Cohen. Rose said that there was no chance that he would ever agree with a reunion with Slash. What's clear is that one of the two of us will die before a reunion and however sad, ugly, or unfortunate anyone views it, it is how it is. Those decisions were made a long time ago and reiterated year after year by one man. Rose was, however, open to working again with Stradlin and McCagan, both of whom he has worked with since the interview took place. In early March 2009, industry insiders speculated Guns N' Roses would launch a summer stadium tour, which eventually would become the Chinese Democracy World Tour 2009-2010. Later that month, the band announced that DJ Ashba would be the new lead guitarist, replacing a departing Robin Fink, who rejoined Nine Inch Nails. Ashba had previously played with former drummer Stephen Adler in Bullet Boys in 1998. In June 2009, it was reported that manager Irving Ozoff had been fired, then rehired, then fired. A year later, Ozoff's company Frontline Management sued Rose, claiming he violated an oral agreement to pay 15% of earnings, or nearly $2 million, from a lucrative concert tour seeking $1.87 million in unpaid fees. Rose filed a $5 million counter-lawsuit against Ozoff, saying that Ozoff sabotaged sales of Guns N' Roses' comeback album and lied about a potential super tour with Van Halen, a band managed by Ozoff, as part of a plan to force Rose to reunite with his estranged former band members. Rose said in his suit that Ozoff failed to promote his 2008 album, Chinese Democracy, and deliberately mishandled concert dates, forcing Rose into a position where he would have no choice but to reunite with the original members of Guns N' Roses for a reunion tour. Rose claimed that Ozoff violated the consent decree by coercing and bullying artists to do what he wants and that upon realizing that he couldn't bully Rose and accomplish his scheme, Ozoff resigned and abandoned Guns N' Roses on the eve of a major tour filing suit for commissions he didn't earn and had no right to receive. The lawsuit was settled to the mutual satisfaction of the parties in 2011. Several years later, 
Guns N' Roses management, led by Rose's former personal assistant Beta Levi's and her family, stated that previous tensions led to an ultimatum of no more managers. Guns N' Roses in Bangalore in 2012 From left to right, Richard Fortas, Axel Rose, Ron Bumblefoot Thau, DJ Ashba, and Tommy Stinson. Guns N' Roses headlined the Friday night at Reading Festival 2010 and closed Leeds Festival two days later. Guns N' Roses was 58 minutes late coming onto the stage, and because of a curfew issued by Reading Council the band's set ended at midnight. The band was therefore not able to complete its set, but nevertheless attempted to play Paradise City without amplification while the audience sang along. Rose orchestrated fan frustration toward the organizers, telling fans that the group would not play at the Leeds Festival. However, two days later the band played the final night of the Leeds Festival, coming onto stage 30 minutes late, and cutting part of the encore, with Rose stating to the crowd, We come here to play for you but the cops and the promoters wanna fuck us in the ass. We would like to play a few more songs for you but we'll just play one. During a concert on September 1st, in Dublin, the band was over an hour late arriving on stage. Rose stopped the band in the middle of the second song, Welcome to the Jungle after multiple bottles were thrown on stage, warning the crowd one more bottle and we go home. It's up to you. We would like to stay. We want to stay. We want to have some fun. After another bottle was thrown, the band left the stage during the fourth song of the set. The band returned to the stage an hour later to finish the show. Former bassist Duff McKagan joined the band on stage for the first time since leaving the band on October 14, 2010 at the O2 Arena, in London, England. He performed four songs with the group, You Could Be Mine, Nice Boys, Knockin' on Heaven's Door, and Patience. The appearance was said to be a spur-of-the-moment decision, as he and Rose happened to be staying in the same hotel. Rose told the audience, there was this guy at the end of my hallway playing all this loud music and shit. What the fuck? Oh it's tough. McKagan later joined Guns N' Roses on part of its tour for two Seattle shows in December 2011, as well as having his band loaded open for Guns N' Roses. Guns N' Roses performed at Rock in Rio 4 on October 2, 2011 during heavy rain, playing Estranged for the first time since 1993. Guitarist Bumblefoot stated that due to the conditions, it was the worst concert he's ever been a part of. Two months later, during a performance in Nashville, TN Civil War also made a return after an 18-year absence. On November 10, 2011, Rose gave his first TV interview in years to Eddie Trunk, Don Jameson and Jim Florentine of That Metal Show, discussing his whole career and the band's future. On December 7, 2011, it was announced that the classic Guns N' Roses lineup was to be inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, along with several other acts, including the Red Hot Chili Peppers and the Faces. Commenting on his Twitter, Rose stated I'd like to thank the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame and our fans. This is your victory. Commenting on the induction during his That Metal Show interview he said I don't know what it means in terms of me with the old band and the old lineup. If we were to be invited, I don't know what they would ask of me. It's up in the air. Slash also commented, saying, Thanks for all the Rand RHF mentions, it's quite an honor to be inducted. Cheers. 3. He went on to say, I have no idea how that's supposed to go. If Axel, Duff, Izzy, and myself start communicating, it could go one way. If we don't, God knows. In early 2012, the band announced shows in the United States and Europe, titled The Up Close and Personal Tour. The shows themselves varied considerably in comparison to the previous Chinese Democracy Tour. All of the North American shows took place in smaller scale clubs, rather than a large arena or stadium. All pyrotechnics were removed from the shows. The European leg of the tour began approximately one month after the band's induction into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Guitarist DJ Ashba discussed a potential follow-up to Chinese Democracy in a 2012 interview, stating I've written and demoed up probably about 12 songs, I think. And some of them Axel has heard, 
some of them he hasn't yet. But I think when we get a little bit of time off, we're gonna hopefully all get together and piece together what we think is gonna be the next best thing. In an interview, Dizzy Reed supported the hypothesis of the classic lineup reunited in the Hall of Fame, saying, I know that all the original band is going to be there. I don't know exactly what's going to go down. It's one of those things I'm sure will all come together and be really cool. Honestly, we haven't spoken about it. I don't know when or why or how to bring it up. On April 11, 2012, Rose released an open letter to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, Guns N' Roses fans and whom it may concern, saying he would not be attending the induction. Rose stated, I respectfully decline my induction as a member of Guns N' Roses to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame and called it a complicated and awkward situation. After the ceremony, Rose released a statement on the band's Facebook page apologizing to the city of Cleveland, where the ceremony took place, and detailing reasons why he did not attend, stating I still don't exactly know or understand what the hall is or how or why it makes money, where the money goes who chooses the voters and why anyone on this board decides who, out of all the artists in the world that have contributed to this genre, is officially rock enough to be in the hall. On April 14, 2012, former Guns N' Roses members Slash, Duff McKagan, Gilby Clark, Stephen Adler and Matt Sorum all reunited at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. The group performed Mr. Brownstone, Sweet Child O' Mine, and Paradise City with Alter Bridge and Slash's band vocalist Miles Kennedy in Rose's absence. Slash mentioned in an interview that all things considered, I don't think any of us wanted to be a part of it initially, didn't think any of us were going to go. It was a thorn in everybody's well, at least a thorn in my side because I was busy doing other stuff. When it finally came down to the wire at the very, very, very last minute I'm talking about the 11 hours and 30 seconds Mark Axel had pulled out. In the same interview, Slash mentioned the prospects of a reunion, stating it's not even something I like to dwell on. I don't even like to make comments because you end up with quotes that sometimes exacerbate the issue. I've got other things going on. I'm very, very proud endlessly proud of everything the band stood for and everything that's gone on with it. Slash then stated in a July 2012 interview that the classic lineup will never reunite. In a later interview, former drummer Stephen Adler stated that Matt Sorum would not take part in a potential reunion unless Adler was involved. Duff McKagan said in 2015, a reunion could happen, and it could not. And I think it would be wonderful, one day, if we reconciled, first and foremost. That alone would be cool. Richard Fortas, being interviewed by the French music website Rock and Live in June 2012, revealed that the band would not play any more dates for the up-close and personal tour, as the band members hoped to spend more time in the studio, hoping to complete the next album by the end of the year. Fortas said, I'm pretty much focused on GNR right now. We're getting ready to go back in the studio, so that's where my head's at right now, that's all I want to think about until the end of the year pretty much. Izzy Stradlin once again joined the band for a surprise performance at a wedding in St. Tropez, France in July 2012. Also in July 2012, the band toured Israel for the first time since 1992. NME reported that year that the band's tour security said they had been instructed by Guns N' Roses management that anyone wearing a slash t-shirt not be allowed into the tour venue. On August 13, 2012, the band announced a residency at the joint in Las Vegas entitled Appetite for Democracy, celebrating the 25th anniversary of the band's debut album, Appetite for Destruction, and the fourth anniversary of the album Chinese Democracy. On November 21, 2012, the band's performance in Vegas was taped in 3D, and was screened across theaters in 2014 before being released as Appetite for Democracy 3D on July 1, 2014. In October 2012, Rose mentioned that the follow-up to Chinese Democracy would not take as long to be released, stating, All the guys are writing, and we recorded a lot of songs over the years. We'll figure out what we feel best about. 
Chinese was done in piecemeal with one person here and one there at different times. In October 2012, Guns N' Roses performed an acoustic set at Neil Young's Bridge School Benefit Show. The performance was widely panned by critics, and Rose claimed an onset of strep throat hampered his vocals. Guns N' Roses in 2010 From left to right, Dizzy Reed, Ron Bumblefoot Thau, Richard Fortas, Axel Rose, DJ Ashba, Chris Pittman, and Tommy Stinson. Drummer Frank Ferrer is not pictured. In August 2013, a new song titled Going Down was leaked online. The track features bassist Tommy Stinson on lead vocals, with Rose providing backup vocals. Bumblefoot confirmed the song to be legitimate on his Twitter. Spin described it as a country tinged, mid tempo lighter razor with lyrics about how you've got nothing good to say, keep your mouth shut. The band launched a South American tour in early 2014, including playing in Brazil and Portugal. For several shows, former bassist Duff McKagan rejoined the band to fill in for Stinson, who had previous commitments to touring with the replacements. The group headlined the Revolver Golden Gods Awards show, with McKagan on bass, on April 24, 2014. During the ceremony, Rose was awarded the Ronnie James Dio Lifetime Achievement Award. After the show, Fortis reiterated the band was working on material and mentioned the possibility of releasing new music within the next year. From May 21 to June 7, 2014, the band returned to Las Vegas for its second residency at the joint, titled No Trickery. An Evening of Destruction In an interview in June 2014, Rose commented on upcoming plans. Reed mentioned that the next album was close to being done in July 2014, adding it was just a matter of picking out which songs will be on it and that the band had a shitload of songs, enough to make up another record or two. Later that month, Fortis discussed the band working on new material and taking a break from touring. A year later, Fortis discussed a potential 2016 tour and mentioned that the next album should be out by then. Reed responded by saying when will it come out? We just don't know yet. Only Axel knows, and he's very secretive. Be patient. Regrouping, not in this lifetime. Tour and future, 2015 present. On July 27, 2015, guitarist DJ Ashba left the band, citing his commitments to his family and other band. Sihase.m Ashba released a statement saying I have reached a point in my life where I feel it's time to dedicate myself to my band Sihase.m, my adoring wife and family, and to the many new adventures that the future holds for me. Several days later, music journalist Gary Groff reported that a confirmed source within the band had told him that Ron Thal was no longer in Guns N' Roses and had left after the 2014 tour. No official announcement from Thal or the band has been made regarding his status. Tommy Stinson then left the band, citing personal reasons keeping him unable to tour. Frank Ferrer clarified the status of the band in mid-2015, saying guns still exist. They have a lot of moving parts, and there's a lot of things in the works, everything is moving forward. On December 29, 2015, Several days after a Guns N' Roses-related teaser was released to movie theaters, Billboard reported that Slash was set to rejoin the band and a reunited lineup will headline Coachella 2016. Rose was set to appear on Jimmy Kimmel Live, the following week to talk about the future of the band, but his appearance was cancelled due to unforeseen circumstances. Guns N' Roses was officially announced as the headliner of Coachella on January 4, 2016, with KROQ reporting Slash and Duff McKagan are rejoining the band. The Coachella Festival confirmed via press release that McKagan and Slash were rejoining. The band's first scheduled concerts with Slash and McKagan took place at the newly opened T-Mobile Arena on April 8 and 9, 2016. On March 25, 2016, the band announced 21 cities as part of a North American tour, dubbed the Not In This Lifetime tour. Additional legs of the tour were added for Latin America, Asia, and Oceania through 2017. Later on, a second North American leg was added for 2017. 
A previously unannounced warm-up gig at the Troubadour in Los Angeles took place on April 1, 2016. Melissa Reese, who has previously worked with former drummer Brian Mantia on several projects, replaced Chris Pittman as the second keyboardist. During the show at the Troubadour, Rose fell off a monitor and broke his foot. Rose was given Dave Grohl's customized throne that Grohl had used to perform when he broke his leg at a concert. At the performance at the first weekend of Coachella, ACDC guitarist Angus Young joined the band on stage, Rose was set to join ACDC as a touring vocalist. Young's guest appearance was only the third time he had jammed with another band since 1977. Rose discussed the regrouping in a June 2016 interview, stating it was always looked at as a possibility, but it never seemed right or felt right. During the interview, Rose also reiterated his intention to release new Guns N' Roses music in the future. Slash later commented on the tour, telling Aerosmith's Joey Kramer in an interview with WZLX that we all were pretty positive, the reunion, would never happen, so it's still sort of blowing our minds. But everybody's really getting along great and I think everybody's come a long way, and it's all cool. During the band's July 6 show in Cincinnati, former drummer Steven Adler joined the band on drums for Out T.A. Get Me and My Michelle. It was the first time since 1990 that Adler performed with the group. Adler would later join the band at shows in Nashville, Los Angeles, and Buenos Aires. Legacy, Style, Influence, and Criticism Guns N' Roses signed with a major record label within eight months of the band's inception, and topped national sales charts weeks after garnering late hours airplay on MTV. Appetite for Destruction is the highest-selling debut album of all time in the United States. Peers of the band in the music industry often spoke highly of the band. Joe Perry stated that the band was the first group to remind him of Led Zeppelin. Ozzy Osbourne stated that Guns N' Roses could have been the next Rolling Stones if the classic lineup stayed together. Country musician Steve Earle stated in 1989 that Guns N' Roses are what every LA band pretends to be. The music of Guns N' Roses is a fusion of punk rock, blues rock, heavy metal, hard rock, and hair metal. The Illusions album saw the band branching out into art rock, while The Spaghetti Incident saw the group blend hard rock with punk rock. Since the group's 1999 revival, the band has retained hard rock features while also experimenting with industrial rock and electronic rock. In the 1990s, the band integrated keyed instruments, played by either Rose or Reed, and accompanied on tour by Teddy Andratus, into the band, and for roughly half of the Use Your Illusion tour, added a horn section to the stage. A heavy influence on both the image and sound of Guns N' Roses was the Finnish band Hanoi Rocks, singer Michael Monroe and Rose have collaborated on various occasions. Rose has stated that the band was massively inspired by groups like Queen, ACDC, the Rolling Stones, Aerosmith, and Rose Tattoo, and that the sound of Appetite for Destruction was influenced by ACDC, Led Zeppelin, The Who, Cheap Trick, Aerosmith, Van Halen, The New York Dolls, and Hanoi Rocks. The band was also influenced by the likes of T-Rex and the Sex Pistols. Rose's orchestral-style songwriter on the Illusion albums were influenced by Queen, Electric Light Orchestra, and Elton John, particularly the album Queen 2. Rose cited the influence of Nirvana's Smells Like Teen Spirit in recording the title track of Chinese Democracy. Critics noted influences of Queen, Wings, and Andrew Lloyd Webber on some songs on Chinese democracy. Guns N' Roses has influenced many modern rock bands such as Fall Out Boy, Avenged Sevenfold, Mother Love Bone, Buckcherry, Hinder, Manic Street Preachers, Nickelback, Bullet for My Valentine, and Black Label Society. Guns N' Roses are still an example of how a band can move rock forward. Sometimes you think, how can you top anything by the Yardbirds, or Zeppelin, or the Stones? And then you hear Guns N' Roses, and it's inspiring. You can think that it's all been written, but it hasn't. In 2002, Q magazine named Guns N' Roses in its list of the 50 bands to see before you die. The television network VH1 ranked Guns N' Roses 9th in its 100 Greatest Artists of Hard Rock special, 
and also 32nd on its 100 Greatest Artists of All Time. Appetite for Destruction was ranked 62nd Greatest Album of All Time in Rolling Stone Magazine's special issue The 500 Greatest Albums of All Time. In 2004, Rolling Stone ranked Guns N' Roses No. 92 on its list of the 100 Greatest Artists of All Time. Welcome to the Jungle has also been voted Best Hard Rock Song out of 100 candidates by VH1. Guns N' Roses was inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame on April 14, 2012. The group is one of the world's best-selling bands of all time, having sold more than 100 million records worldwide, including shipments of 45 million in the United States. The U.S. release of the PlayStation game Mega Man X5 had the names of the game's bosses changed in honor of the band. Guns N' Roses has also received significant criticism throughout the years. The band received criticism for drug and alcohol use in the 80s and early 90s. He long periods of time between albums are another source of criticism. Songs such as One in a Million and the cover of Charles Manson's Look at Your Game, Girl were considerably controversial upon release. In addition, some lyrics have been regarded as sexist. The band has also been criticized for tardiness and starting shows later than advertised. The band's late appearances and war with Reading and Leeds festivals have been criticized by artists and peers of the group in the industry. In October 2009, Dolrich Schnoss's record labels Independiente and Domino sued Guns N' Roses, alleging that the band had committed copyright infringement by using portions of Schnoss compositions in the track Riyadh and the Bedouins on the album Chinese Democracy. The band claimed the samples were provided by a member of the album's production team who has assured us that these few seconds of sound were obtained legitimately. Chinese democracy was banned in the People's Republic of China, due to perceived criticism in its title track of the government of the People's Republic of China and reference to the Falun Gong. The Chinese government said through the media that it turns its spear point on China.